Hey guys, welcome back. So today we'll be discussing the second part of this series, the Australian Navy. So yeah, um, to start off with we'll be discussing the, basically the big strategic problem with Australia's Navy, um, um, acquisition projects, and finally what we can do to deal with the current problems, and what sorts of things we should be looking at buying. But yeah, so without further ado, let's just get into it. Basically, the biggest drawback of the Australian Navy is this tactic of needing to be part of an, extent, an extension of America's military force. You see, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with interacting with other countries and being able to work within alliances or even outside of alliances. You know, having a military that can work well with partners and potentially other countries just really is an important thing. However, the problem that we face here in Australia is that it conflicts more than that, right? It's more than just this little concern of, oh, you know, we need to help America. It's turned into an obsessive thing of we need to be part of America, almost allowing us to add five more states to the United States So The problem is, at the end of the day, is that Australia's defence force has been so optimised with the war on terror. I'll probably discuss this more in my video on the army because it affects it much more. The thing is though is that effectively, just for a quick overview, the war on terror has forced Australia into this thing of needing a repower from ground force, a lot of focus into that, a lot of focus into helping America out and swatting them on the side. Uh, rather than actually having some standalone capacity that we just have World War, World War II, um, Vietnam War, and then sort of up until rather pretty, kind of recently actually. But yeah, for the most part we need to understand that again, like I'm not I'm not the pro nor against America. Right? I'm neutral. I'm purely talking cost benefits here. Like at the end of the day, America is currently the biggest superpower in the world, most powerful country in the world. It's in our interest to be friends with them, it's in our interest to work alongside them. However, there are definitely some downsides and of course there are some things that need to be taken into account when we do this. So hopefully that makes sense. So currently Australia's got some large issues with its procurement projects. We have first of all the AUKUS deal, we have the Hunter class frigates, we have the Arafuru class offshore patrol vessel. And there are a couple of other small things that we could discuss. So what are some ta what are, what are the things that I recommend you? Well first of all, AUKUS. AUKUS is for me it's purely how well it performs. Right? At the moment I don't really care much for nuclear submarines nor do I care about this conventional versus nuclear debate. Right? You can have the best, most powerful nuclear submarine, don't get me wrong. But this submarine could be decades ahead of anything that ever will come out. Yeah, it could be invincible, it could be made of, we don't know, like it could shoot kryptonite infused torpedoes at all the enemies and you know, all that sort of fancy jazz, you know, and it'll never be detected for another 2,000 years. The problem is though is that in 48 years, no, sorry, not 48, by 2048, for a, this, when we're getting them, is for me a bit too long of a wait. The fundamental problem is that what we're facing with the AUKUS deal is that yes, nuclear subs are much better than conventional, but at the end of the day, it's doesn't it's irrelevant as to how good it is if we don't even have it, right? It's like turning up to well, it's literally turning up to a fight, going, oh yes, be afraid of us. You don't want to pick a fight with us. How strong we are. Okay, so so what do you have? Well, we're going to have. A nuclear submarine that's world beating in the next 20 years. So if you don't understand the problem here it's that um, a lot of analysts are saying the, ne the real conflict so any conflict with China could or other countries could potentially occur in the next 5-10. Basically we've got an extra 26 years before we get the final AUKUS ship. It's the exact same way time for the um, short fin barracuda and if we cannot get these submarine soon, we should cancel that specific part of the deal. Then of course we come to the BAE system Hunter class frigates. This is a bit of a pain in the backside. Realistically the Hunter class is a really decent frigate in concept, however it's a really bad one in practice. 
the fundamental problem facing the hunting ice first of all it's oversized second of all it has only one screw and then third of all it doesn't have the armament of a ship of its size but, and then that ties into it's and that all ties into expense right starting off it's oversized the hunter class frigate is just way bigger than anything it should be right it's a frigate that's bigger than our current destroyers hopefully that explains everything the problem is that this means you're paying destroyer money and i'll also drag the cost up now already you're paying destroyer money for a ship that has the capacity of a frigate right it carries 32 vertical launch cells for missile systems as well as probably about eight or so eight or so anti-ship missile launch launch systems however the problem is this at the end of the day it's a bad bad choice because we are buying a frigate and we're getting a destroyer that's armed on level with a frigate that's the big problem in hand with this entire concept of, for this deal it's not beneficial right it doesn't give us what we need it doesn't give us this capacity that we're desiring all it simply does is just sit down and go okay cool what are we buying we're getting a new big frigate cool what's its ability well the same as a frigate but it's the size of a destroyer in other words there's no real gain to having this there's no massive advantage that it can provide over an opponent warship and at the end of the day if we're really going to be buying ships this size we should just buy more air warfare destroyers if that's really what people are after another big problem is that it only has one um, gas powered turbine this is a key key problem this means if anything goes wrong so say catastrophic error in the middle of world war 3 something goes wrong something just stops working it's dead in the water it's stuck it can't go anywhere they don't have another turbine to rely on and that's a big thing that will be cataclysmic for the crew if you're in a modern war and you're stuck in the waters right it, it, that would be terrible so there's also the other thing is that the um hunter class is still going to take a while longer to buy some like they're starting to build them in late 20 um 20s so late 2020s and let's say 2027 or so like that's when they're starting to build them. so that's not really great anyway so now we come to the RFR. this is actually the most optimistic of all these acquisition projects it actually get this right is a functional ship or supposedly is I mean, if there are some things where the same, we've got seaworthiness issues, so I, I don't know. But the thing is, though, is at the end of the day, like it's more promising as there's not much needed to be done. Right? It's an existing concept, like it's based off a already existing ship design. It's just been down here. Basically, with the RFR, it, it just has to be up armed. It's pretty much the main downside to it. That, that's that's basically. It. Um, potentially strengthening the deck to allow for helicopters is a choice that can be made. I don't mean really, I'm not necessarily for or against it. Um, it could be potentially equipping attack drones or something onto the top would be a possible option. So now I've discussed all this, how do we how do we fix these problems? First of all, if Orcus cannot de deliver the promised submarine within a reasonable time span, I recommend we cancel the project. At the end of the day, it comes down to purely what it offers right if, if again and as i said before the issue is your submarine is only as good as what you can fight with right you can have the most magical powered submarine it's it's super you know, relies completely on superman power right you got 14 supermans in that reactor core the problem is though is that if you can't actually feel that then there's no real use to it at the end of the day and that's the big problem so if it's if it can't be provided in a reasonable time frame, and I'm saying like the first one within five years, I don't believe this project is what we need. Another a choice that we could go with is first of all Swedish Sons and Collins design, or perhaps something built by Jap Japan or South Korea. These are countries that have offered, or potentially a German submarine actually. These are countries that have offered us with good projects that we actually went for. However, we went against those for a um, bigger ship the short fin barracuda not completely sure why but you know that does the deal at the time those would be countries i'd recommend looking into a sons of the collins class would be a definite potential choice 
given the fact that Sol's, Cold's class is still competitive. It's still a good submarine. It's just it's getting older and older and the actual structure of the ships is just getting much more fragile and they need replacing now. So that that's one thing. Another thing would be to also invest into large amounts of um, underwater vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles. The, an example of this would be the Andrew UAV that the Australian military has been... No, UUV, sorry, I keep getting my Air Force stuff mixed up with my um, Navy, sorry. Um, the Andrew UUV underwater unmanned vehicle um, is definitely something that I think would be worth worth looking at like we're getting we'll be we have an existing deal with these however if they if they work out really well like just buy a lot of them we need lots of these they are a kind of concept that we need to worry about so however one bit of food for thought with these would be potentially equipping them with a tomahawk or some form of cruise missile that we can use to target ground based time ground based hostile forces as well as a potential torpedo system now for the frigates um i would I have one of a few choices. First of all, cancel and buy a warfare destroyers. There are some con cons to this, but there's a bunch of pros as well. The pros are basically this: we get a first of all, we get more warships that are proven to be strong. Right, we've got the um, contractors that build the air warfare destroyers have already sent us have actually been offering to build them, build more, and they're saying they can get them down in a really competitive speed. And they can get more done if they need to. This is something that's definitely worth taking into account for Australia, in my opinion. Like, it's just something that's, it's a really good deal and it's really convenient. The next thing is buying another three or so um, air warfare destroyers, but then cha but changing the rest, so cancel three Hunter class frigates and then focus the rest continue the deal this is a choice that um is kind of interesting like it's one that i've seen flows at a couple of times it's it sort of depends on just how it's done like at the end of the day the hunter class will be a decent frigate it's just not going to be a good ship for what you're paying for so whilst it may be a decent boat it's just not going to be bang for buck and that's sort of the big problem with it however of course that is a good choice that could be carried out Another deal is getting three more air warfare destroyers and um, getting a different class of frigate. This is actually really convenient under the AUKUS deal, as we could potentially find some way to get a new frigate through that. Or if not, BAE Systems still makes really good British frigates. Right? Britain makes really, really effective ships. They just don't uparm them and they don't equip them with the amount of weapon systems they need. However, if Australia chooses to do this, I'd, this is actually the path I recommend where we just buy a new form of frigate. Because at the end of the day, like, there's nothing particularly to be lost. The biggest problem with the, with the um, Hunter class right now is planning and building. At the end of the day, we don't really need that if the, we, we're buying a model of pre-existing warship. There's plenty of existing ships that are advanced, really powerful and really capable. That would suit our needs that the British can build. So I think that would be something we could definitely think about. I would, however, adding to this one, would add an extra three air warfare destroyers, just that way we can boost our air warfare destroyer capacity. Now for our next big thing, the RF Rural. The RF Rural class needs to be up armed. This is because Australia has a severe lack of combat capable warships, something that has plagued Australia for a long, long time now. The problem is that a lot of analysts have quickly realised, and a lot of people that quickly pay attention and quickly pick up on, is that we don't have enough ships. For understanding, a typical LHD unit in peacetime would typically consist of one, one air warfare destroyer, two frigates, one LHD, and one amphibious or supply ship. So let's say we're in wartime. We might, let's say, add another frigate to that, you know, so we've now got four combat capable warships. LHD and supply ship. The problem is fundamentally though that we now have eight. So we deploy two of these groups, we will be having eight out of our eleven capable combat capable warships being deployed. We would have two. One of these groups would have almost a third, as you know, more than a third of our 
actual combat capable navy, half of our LHDs, and half of our supply ships. That's that's how bad the situation is. The problem is we need more combat capable warships so we can back this sort of stuff up. This is why up arming the Arafura, or the other concept is that um a lot of people have fielded is buying a new Corvette class to replace it. I am personally for up arming the Arafura as it is a model of warship that is already existing. Like it's based off an existing ship, so there's just going to be some teething problems. But the other thing is though is that we've already also just started building them and they just started getting delivered and actually finished. So it's much more convenient to just up arm these warships rather than completely replace them. Of course, additional warships, so auxiliary ships, auxiliary um, corvettes could be an option, but I'll discuss that actually in a couple of moments. Basically, it's important to up arm the arrow for the, um, with, missiles, with missile systems and potentially larger guns. Now, the missile systems we can be looking at would definitely include, first of all, some form of anti-ship missile. The next would be a form of potential, this is more potential, an anti-air weapon system, and then finally, a better gun. Currently, the Arafura has um, been backlogged to have a 25mm gun rather than the initial 40mm. There's a lot of debate about what size or calibre the gun has to be, um, but it ranges from 57 to 40 at the end of the day, I'm not really too concerned about what size the gun is, as long as it's around 40 millimeters, because 25 millimeters is just really small for a ship that size. Um, in terms of missiles, current um, anti-ship missiles, so harpoons would be a decent option, or potentially some new missiles. For for example, the naval strike missile that Australia and America are working. That would be an ideal option. Now, the reason why this is so important is, first of all, it allows us to, one, support our car our amphibious units. This is what I just discussed earlier, like, about minutes or so, with where we had the, um, how much of our fleet just one task group would take up. At the end of the day, it's really important to understand that, and, um, it, it's just important to take into account how much space and how much time these ships will take, right? These ships are really important and they just boost our capacity to have defences. You, know, you have those extra ships on the outside looking for enemy submarines, enemy frigates, enemy hostile units. The next thing is, is that it has a high combat reward but low com combat risk. And it's completely opposite for the opponents. Basically these are smaller ships now that can sink a much larger enemy ship. And that's something to keep in mind. A ship, these size would be, a ship this size with four anti-ship missiles would likely be able to take down a hostile frigate or even destroy it. Potentially even, if used correctly, could be used to take down enemy landing ships um, and potentially aircraft carriers. This is something vital to understand as that's the point. These are smaller ships that, first of all, you don't have as much risk. Second of all, they can cause as much damage to an opponent fleet as your larger ships. Meaning that when an opponent goes after them, they could lose a higher amount of ships or more valuable ships than the ship that we just lost. Now for another concept, uh, equipping an F-35 squadron wing to both of our um, LHTs. This is something that's been debated on within the defence community, but I think it is something that should be raised as a question in our latest defence review. Should we equip an F-35 wing to the LHTs? This has definite advantages, the advantages of which would be a long-range power projection with fighter jets, which is just something that, whilst helicopters are excellent, it's just something a helicopter can't provide. Second of all, it would just allow for more interoperability with our allies and potentially potent, um, countries like China. It would allow us to do exercises with them, but in times of conflict, it also just means the ships are better defended. Now to the, um, now for finishing this off, we've got one final bit. A potential theory that I have. One, a concept, this concept is effectively creating a joint naval task force with Australia and many of the Pacific Island nations. This is something that could be considered um, with these extra corvettes I mentioned before. What you can do is potentially buy three or so corvettes and have them manned by Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, um, and the smaller countries around us. This would they would be made up of joint crews so that way they wouldn't and there wouldn't be 
acting in any way that would contradict any nation's personal interest. Effectively, this would just boost power within the region and be able to give small island nations some form of defence force against a larger hostile threat or, or anything else, really. But, yeah. Um, that's more just like me just thinking, you know, what we could potentially do. Um, these frigate, th these small corvettes could equip be potentially equipped with 25mm guns for just anti-air missile systems or, you know, light anti-ship missiles or short-range anti-ship missile systems. At the end of the day, they don't need to be super heavily armed and they don't need to be designed to take on hostile destroyers or cruisers. But yeah, that's basically it for now. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. Um, the next video coming out will be either on our Air Force or the or the Army. Yeah. I thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you very much. Bye.